how we thank God for this spirit-filled weekend that has invigorated us and encouraged us. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in a moment of prayer as we go to God and ask God's presence, continued presence, ask God's continued power, God's continued provision for this moment of proclamation. Gracious God, how we love you and thank you. Thank you, God, for the tangible presence in this room. Thank you, God, for assembling us, oh God, so we could come and worship you and hear from you. God, we're not asking that you come. We know that you're already here. And God, we know that there can be no preaching unless the real preacher shows up in the person of the Holy Ghost. And so would you now embody me like never before. Stand up in me, oh God. Be in my mind and in my mouth. We thank you for the privilege of preaching. Thank you for what preaching does to the hearer. Thank you, God, that faith comes by hearing. And so, God, we've come today to bolster somebody's faith. Help them walk just a little bit further, oh God. Make them just a little bit stronger. Encourage them. God, with this message, save somebody. With this message, heal somebody. With this message, set somebody free. And we're giving you praise in advance for the harvest that shall come forth from the seed having been deposited. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are my strength and my redeemer. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. If you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, I would that you would join me initially in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Thank you, Reverend, for reading uh, in part uh, our sermonic text today. I want to begin reading in the second chapter, beginning with the first verse of Joshua. I'm going to be reading several passages of scripture that will take us through Joshua into Hebrews and lastly, the book of James. So keep your Bibles and your Bible apps open. It is our custom to stand for the reading of the word. So all who are able, would you rest on your feet and follow me. Scripture should also appear on the screen. Listen for the word of the Lord. Beginning in Joshua, the second chapter, verse one. It says, then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Joshua 6, 17, Joshua 6. 17, all of these are from the NIV. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. We have read so far Joshua 2 and 1. Joshua 6 and 17. Now I want to take you to Joshua 6, 25. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now let's go to the New Testament. Uh-huh. We're going to Hebrews 11.31. I know if you're on your app, just scroll with me. <laughs> Click when you get to Hebrews. We've read three passages so far. Joshua 
Joshua 6.17, Joshua 6.25. We're now at Hebrews 11.31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Move over just a little bit. We're going to James 2.25. James 2.25, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Before you sit down, I don't know about you, but it is quite clear that three different biblical writers wanted us to know that Rahab was a uh -huh. Even when talking about her faith and her obedience, she was still referred to as a prostitute. Even when the writer James applauds Rahab's righteousness, James still identified her as a prostitute. For the next few moments that are hours together, I want to talk about a case of mistaken identity. A case of mistaken identity. You may be seated. A case of mistaken identity. My sisters and my brothers, we live in a world that is obsessed by labels. We are labeled as white black or not black enough. Latino or Hispanic, we are labeled as Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, moderate or independent, gay or straight, short and tall, light and dark, intelligent or clueless, lower class or middle class, blue collar, blue collar and white collar, immigrant or American, normal or abnormal, old or young, patriot or infidel, saint or sinner and other. Nobody is safe from being labeled. What's unfair, however, about this labeling game is that if any of us in here ever decides to make a change, to turn over a new leaf, or wants to check a different box, somebody somewhere is gonna make it their business to remind us of the tag or the label we used to have from our former life. Can I just take my time? One of those somebodies is the devil, an accuser of the brethren and the sisterin, who specializes in bringing up our past mistakes, our previous missteps, making us feel guilty, ashamed, and unworthy of God's grace, mercy, and love, even though we've been delivered and set free from our sins a long time ago. I came this morning to talk to all the people who have been trying to escape their previous labels. I came to talk to all the leopards who have changed their spots, all of the tigers who have altered their stripes. I've come to talk to every sister who since they've met Jesus have lowered your hemline and covered up your cleavage. <laughs> However, I've also come to talk to the people who are currently in the struggle. People who have been trying to quit. Fill in the blank. I've been trying to move on. Trying to get it together. Anybody in here? Am I talking to anybody? Trying to change, wanting to know who Jesus is, but who feel as if they are powerless against this invisible force of darkness called their past. I've come to tell you today about a God who is willing, ready, and able to remove the stench and the stigma of your current scandalous label in order to give you a new designer original label, to give you a new name and a new life. Are you ready to delve into the text? 
The historical backdrop for this message is a picture of the Israelites preparing themselves to cross the Jordan River over into Canaan, the promised land that God had sworn to give their ancestors. The Lord had informed Joshua that this land of promise was a land flowing with milk and honey and that it was already theirs. God had already given them the land. They just needed to go see it before they possessed it. I said something. They just needed to go see it before they possessed it. And possessing this land meant they would have to fight for it. Just because God has made you a promise doesn't mean you won't have to fight to secure it. Before each conquest, Joshua would send spies out on a reconnaissance mission to obtain full information as to the city's strength, whether it was walled and fortified or whether it was open. Joshua gave these particular spies specific instructions. Their job was to scout out the best way to approach the city, to assess the character and the resources of its inhabitants. Stay with me. The city of Jericho was of particular interest to the Israelites. Why? Because it stood in the way of them getting to the Jordan River. And the Jordan River was the only thing that stood between them and the promised land. The text says that the spies went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Rahab, the prostitute, lived in Jericho. She was a foreigner as far as the nation of Israel was concerned, and she and her people were considered enemies. On top of that, she's a harlot, a lady of the evening, a woman of ill repute. And with all of those labels, we would have every right to assume that she knows nothing about the Lord, or do we? Should we assume that just because we see you smiling and lifting up holy hands every Sunday that all is well in your life and you enjoy an intimate relationship with the Most High God? See, I know most of us want people to think that we have nothing in common with Rahab. Just keep looking straight ahead, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. But I bet... None of us are willing to throw open our secret closets for a public tour. And I don't mean your prayer closets. Uh, I bet most of us would not be so quick to invite people to pull back our bed sheets, to read our journals, to see what websites we surf on the internet, or hear some of the music we listen to on our playlist, or go through and read our text messages. Hallelujah, if you hear me. Uh, in our text today, we've been introduced to a sister by the name of Rahab. The biblical record has more than adequately told us what she does. However, we still don't know who she is. We know that she has contact and influence with the king of Jericho, but we don't know who she is. We know that she has a mama and a daddy, brothers and sisters, but we don't know who she is. In fact, when many of us heard that she was a prostitute, we had already made up my, our minds that we knew everything we needed to know about her. I already had made uh, assumptions about who she was because of what she did. It would shock many of us to know what some people have gone through just to get here today. What kind of courage it took to uh, uh, leave home and what kind of courage it will take to go back. We've already made assumptions about the person sitting next to us, which is why you hadn't spoken to him. I see. Woo, it's going to get rough in here. When we encounter Madam Rahab in the text... We meet her as an adult. 
There are many Bible story pictures showing Rahab demurely dressed, standing in the foyer of a cheery little cottage, a cozy fire warming the room, and sweet little flowers to freshen the atmosphere. No, let's not get Rahab's context refused with the 130,000 Las Vegas porn star that's in relationship with a former... <sighs> or should I say current presidential candidate. <sighs> ah, uh, unfortunately, from what we know of most prostitution realities then and now, that rosy picture is misleading. Rahab lived on the wall of Jericho, on the very boundary between inside and outside. This was no deluxe apartment in the sky. Instead, we should envision a small, cramped area, a place of outcast. This isn't a woman dressed in her Sunday's best, but rather dressed for a Saturday night special. But what do we really know about Rahab's life? Stay with me. Her society would have rejected her. Her career would have exposed her to dirty, possibly diseased men who sought to use her for only one purpose. However, her story doesn't end there. We have other questions to consider. Verse 3 of Joshua chapter 2 tells us that she has direct line of communication to the king. Some theologians have surmised that Rahab, in addition to being a prostitute, she was also a news gatherer. For the king at a time when the country was full of strangers and enemies from far and near. Ah, but let's see how she got there. Although the text doesn't tell us anything about her, about her, trialhood, about her trialhood, uh, would you travel with me in my sanctified imagination back to Rahab's first grade class? I can see the classroom now. Little Rahab is there with her long hair and pigtails. Little ribbons, bright eyed and full of hope. The teacher is standing at the front of the class and she's asking that perennial question that every first grade teacher asks, what do you want to be when you grow up? Can you just imagine little Rahab beaming, waving her hand, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. I'm sure when it was Rahab's turn to speak, that she spoke of becoming a woman of great prominence and respect in her community and a model citizen among her people. You just can't make me believe that when she raised her hand, she says, teacher, I want to be a harlot. That's right, you heard me, I want to be a prostitute. I want to set my own hours, pick my own clients and have a scandalous reputation in the community. Quite the contrary, my dears. Although the biblical text doesn't tell us how it happened, I believe that something went terribly wrong in Rahab's house. A life of prostitution was not in the original design. Can I contemporize the text? Uh, I believe Rahab's daddy used to have a good corporate job. And one day he came home and announced that he had been downsized because his corporate company said that they could get cheaper labor in India. And with that loss of job, he also left, left, lost his health insurance. Mama found out that she had breast cancer. Y'all not with me here? Because how many of us are just one catastrophic event mm -hmm. from being out on the street? Mama has breast cancer, and, and with no health insurance, what little savings they had was used to pay medical bills. Ah, uh, I need you to understand, this was survival prostitution. This wasn't the kind of prostitution that, uh, that, that got you a coach purse or the latest new sports car. This was the kind of prostitution that if Rahab didn't lay on her back, the family didn't need. I don't know how it is in Southern California, but in Houston, Texas, there are young girls who go to school by day and walk the streets by night in order to support the family. 
But here's the truth. Lady Karima, some of us in here right now are hating on Rahab. Because Pastor, at least she got paid. Some of us gave it away and have nothing to show for it. Come on, holly if you hear me. Look straight ahead, we'll never know, we'll never know. This may be the testimony of somebody in this place right now. Hear me well, lean in. Somehow, some way, you may have started out in something innocent. It could be anything, but then Satan perverted it and made you think you couldn't live without it. It began to control how you behaved and dictated the kinds of people you hung around. And at first, it was just something you did. But over time, it became who you were. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but Satan has convinced you that after all of this time, you can't do any better. You don't deserve any better, and it's too late to change. You are sitting in here right now wanting to change, wanting to be whole desiring to be free but you're thinking what's the use I've lived with this label for too long pitiful is now my name broke is all I'll ever be single and sad is how I'll die guilt and shame are my only friends precious ones I stopped by today to tell you that you are suffering from a case of mistaken identity that is not who you are. That is not whom God created you to be. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the elect of God. You are eternally chosen, bought with a price, saved by grace, the apple of God's eye, and destined for greatness. Let's see what happens when the spies show up in Jericho. The first question we must ask of the text is, if these spies had been sent out on a secret mission for the Lord, and they're supposed to be on the clock, how in the world did they have time or even get directions to the local prostitute's house, being that they were new in town and all? Some theologians posit that Rahab's brothel doubled as an inn. Hotel, motel, holiday. <laughs> yeah, I knew y'all were in here. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Where visitors to the city would come and rent a room. Y'all, 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 y'all not with me here. Y'all, 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 y'all not with me here. Uh, evidently, Rahab's establishment was a notable spot on the city registry because the king of Jericho kept tabs on who came and who went. <laughs> I can see Rahab as she looks through the peephole when the knock comes. Can I contemporize the text? <laughs> oh, Lord, where are these two choir boys going? <laughs> Bumpkins just fell off the turnip truck. Get in here before you get yourselves killed. Can I say a few words about those of us Christians who think we're slick trying to sneak and creep in places we don't have any business? Come on, the anointing on your life will blow your cover. Go ahead and put on the darkest shades, put on your best wig, dress up in your Prada rags, and as soon as you open your mouth, the gig is going to be up. If you've been hanging with God for any length of time, the Holy Ghost is going to expose you. I'll never forget, I was somewhere with a friend, wink, wink. I wasn't doing anything wrong. They were. <laughs> and the next thing I heard was, Reverend, is that you? 
What else could I say? And they wanted to know what was I doing there. And then the spirit quickened me and I said, Saint, is that you? <laughs> she, she pulls the man into the house, looks right and looks left to see if anyone followed them. Rahab recognizes that these men are not customers. Rahab knows these are not regular people. The text never tells us how the introductions went. However, we know for a fact that they did not tell her that they were spies coming to scout out the land in order to destroy it. But rather, Rahab discerned that hope had come to her house. For she takes the two men immediately and hides them on the roof. The king of Jericho sent Rahab a message and requested that she bring out the spies who had entered her house. Now there is a significant dynamic shift in the text. If Rahab had been a nobody, the king's men would have showed up unannounced with no warrant, broken down her door, rushed in, tore up her house to search and seize at will. But Rahab was no garden variety prostitute. Rahab was a power broker. When questioned, she was cool, calm, and collected. You remember the text was read? She said, yes, of course they were here. But I don't know where they came from. Men are in and out of here all of the time. You think I check ID? Rahab was brave, decisive and quick on her feet. Before the spies laid down for the night, she goes up to the roof to talk to the spies. Rahab pleads with the spies, swear by the Lord. Wait, 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 wait. Rahab, the prostitute, what do you know about the Lord? Come on now. I mean, because we've already made some assumptions about you. We've already judged who you are by what you do. But it says that Rahab says, swear by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Yeah. Rahab the prostitute says, listen, I know that the Lord, there it is again, there it is again. Rahab, what are you doing talking about the Lord? I know that the Lord has given this land to you and everybody in this country is afraid of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea and what he did with the king Sion and uh, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. Hear this for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Well, well wait what, what did you say Rahab? Did, did I hear you the harlot? The prostitute? Just say that you know the Lord. Their God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Oh no, there must be some mistake here. And then I wondered of the text. How in the world did a prostitute cut off from society hear about the Lord in a brothel? I love how you turned your head like that. <laughs> how did she hear about the Red Sea? And what the Lord did with the Red Sea and the brothel? I would just think there had to be some church folk oh, yeah. <laughs> coming through the brothel. Talked about how the Lord had delivered them. How the Lord had saved them. Y'all not with me here? Because how in the world? Come on, heathens aren't talking about the Lord in a brothel. It must be. Y'all not with me here? Somebody who knows the Lord that came in and talked about the Lord in order for her to know about. 
Everybody knows if you're a prostitute, you can't possibly know anything about the Lord. However, the text is clear. This is Rahab's narrative. We heard how the Lord delivered you and how he brought you out. And in spite of the Israelite origin of the spies, it's Rahab who best understands the nature of Yahweh. It is indeed Rahab who saves the lives of the Israelite spies first before they save her life. A woman that would not have hesitated to slaughter in combat if not for the divine design of God. I told you about labeling people. Rahab's faith in the Lord had been cultivated by the story she had been hearing by the Lord. How do I know? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The kingdom design that God had planned for Rahab was about to be revealed. So I've come with some good news and I'm going to let you go. The spirit of the living God told me to tell you that it doesn't matter how long you've been in what you've been in or how long you've been doing what you've been doing or how long you've been thinking the way you've been thinking. When you decide you're going to stop conforming to the pattern of this world and decide you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit, God is able to bring you out, lift you up, turn you around, place your feet and your life on solid ground. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. Somebody shout, I'm coming out of Jericho. <laughs> Come on, somebody shout, I'm coming out of Jericho. And whether Rahab knows this God of Israel intimately or not, we know this God knows her and has a design and a divine purpose for her life. The deal is set. Spies go back to camp and report that the Lord has surely given them the city. Fast forward to chapter 6. Joshua and the people march around the city of Jericho on the seventh day. Seven times shouted and the wall of the city collapses. The biblical text says in Joshua 6.21 that Joshua and his army destroyed everything in it except Rahab. Come on, finish it. The prostitute. Uh-huh. Yeah, don't forget that. Don't, 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 don't forget that. Uh, then Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Amazingly, you're, you're, you're not remembering. Amazingly, y'all remember where Rahab stayed, right? She stayed in the city wall of Jericho. You gonna miss it? Rahab, the prostitute, stayed in, not on, the city wall of Jericho. But interestingly enough, when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, The part of the wall that Rahab, the prostitute, lived in was left standing. I wish I had somebody here. Have you ever been in a situation where you had no business? Everybody else got caught. Everybody else got sent up. But somehow the Lord preserved you. It's not because you've been good. It's not because you deserved it. But God decided that he would not let these things be. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Tell somebody, even with all my labels, I'm still standing. Come on. With all of my labels, I'm still standing. People said you wouldn't make it, but you're still here. God saved you in spite of your labels. <laughs> it's time to get out of here. I was going to tell you all about how your destiny was designed by God, that you have a God-given destiny. But, but I really just want to get to it because I think it's time to go. Oh, your destiny requires your cooperation. God's not going to do it all. You were saved in spite of your labels. Now, we showed you how many times Rahab was called a prostitute. But when God saved her 
and brought her out, uh, something happened. Uh, so, Mr. Media, would you turn to Matthew with me? Would y'all take out your Bibles one more time? Take out your Bibles one more time. Just one more time and I'm out your way. One more time and I'm out your way. Matthew 1. Matthew 1. Matthew 1. Ah, Matthew 1. You've been calling me a prostitute all of this time. Even when you talked about my obedience, I was Rahab the prostitute. Even when you talked about my faith, I was Rahab the prostitute. But I want you to see that when you hook up with Jesus, I want you to see that when you line your life up with Jesus, that which they once called you, they will call you no more. Here we go. Matthew 1, 1 through 6. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Keep reading, Reverend. Okay. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mama was Rahab. Take a look at it. She's in the genealogy of Jesus. And when she's in the genealogy of Jesus, guess what? Her label fell off. She's no longer Rahab the prostitute. She's Rahab the mama. She's Rahab the grandmama. Hi! 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 What happened? It was a case of mistaken. You, you saw it. Did, 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 you, did you see it? You, you saw it on the screen, didn't you? You know I'm just not embellishing the text. You know I'm just not trying to prove my point. But when she lined up with Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus will let you in his family? Regardless of who you used to be. Aren't you glad Jesus will let you in his family? Regardless of what you used to do. Aren't you glad Jesus will let you in his family? In spite of what you're still doing. A case of mistaken identity. I want to tell somebody today it doesn't matter how long your past is, how long your record is, but I tell you what, there's going to be a time when you're going to line your life up with Jesus. And Jesus is going to remove every label every tag that you used to have. If any woman, any man be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old labels are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where are you, Rahab? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. There's no more shame. There's no more guilt. So where are you, Ray? Come on, just, 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 mm, mm, slip up, mm, mm, just slip up your hand. Now shout in freedom because you can't hold it against me anymore. Things I used to do, 
I don't do any 